Well, if you were here last week, uh, you may remember that I talked about a couple of my favorite unsung Bible heroes, uh, Bezalel and Oholiab. I talked about how Bezalel was chosen by God by name uh, for a specific purpose, which was to build the tabernacle. I talked about how God filled Bezalel with the Holy Spirit and gave him absolutely everything that he needed to complete his task. And I talked about how God fills us with the Holy Spirit and how God has purpose for our lives as well. He has work for us to do. I quoted uh, Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's given each of us spiritual gifts that we should be using to further his kingdom and to edify the church. God is faithful to supply everything that we need in order to fulfill our purposes. All we need to do is trust in his promises and obey. I pointed out that we have unsung heroes right here at Calvary Church. You probably know many of them. Well, today I want to talk about some other unsung heroes. Whereas Bezalel knew what his calling was, some of the people I want to talk about today had no idea that they were being used by God, even though great things were accomplished for his kingdom. These are ordinary people doing ordinary things that turn out to be extraordinary in God's eyes. The message is in uh, two parts today. Uh, first part consists, I'm going to tell you some stories, uh, abbreviated stories from the Bible and, uh, and one from modern life. And then the second half of, of the uh, of the message is telling you why I told you those stories. Well, the first story comes from the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. Here's what it says. Now, Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. Uh, Aram is what we call Syria today. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. In other words, she was Mrs. Naaman's slave girl. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Well, of course, she's talking about the prophet Elisha. As a young Jewish girl, she would have been taught about God. I'm sure she, uh, you know, obviously she had heard about the prophet Elisha and the things that he had done. And she had faith that through Elisha, God could and would cure Naaman. Well, long story short, Naaman went with his horses and chariots, which means it was a big deal to him. He went to uh, Elisha to be cured. <clears throat> but Elisha didn't even come out of his house to talk to the guy. He just sent a note out and said, uh, uh, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. Well, Naaman, Naaman didn't like that, that uh, answer. He, he was an important man. <clears throat> he was a big shot. He wanted to be treated like one. <clears throat> He was expecting some sort of ritual or ceremony. Uh, he said, uh, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Naaman thought that washing in the Jordan was ridiculous. It sounded ridiculous to him. <clears throat> but what he didn't understand was that healing people from leprosy is Easy for God. It doesn't take a big elaborate ceremony. It just takes faith. Faith put into action with obedience. Well, when he finally did give up his pride, 
he did go wash in the Jordan and he was cleansed of his leprosy and, and God was glorified. There's a lot to be learned from this story. Naaman's attitude, Elisha's faith, God's power, and, and, and on and on. But all of that would be moot if not for the slave girl. She didn't know that she was going to be an integral part of God's plan to bring glory to himself by healing Naaman. She was not aware of the impact that she was having on other people then and even now. She was a slave, a nobody. We, we don't even know her name. She was going about her daily life doing whatever it is slave girls do. And she made an offhand remark that changed the lives of Naaman and his wife forever. And it ultimately brought tremendous glory to God, even to this day. And it's all because she believed God could heal Naaman. Simple as that. She had faith. She expressed it in a very simple sentence. If the story of Naaman were uh, pulled on network news, I doubt if a slave girl would even be mentioned. In the eyes of man, what she did was nothing. It was insignificant. But in God's eyes, it was an act of faith that was worthy to be recorded in the Word of God. Ordinary people doing ordinary things that turn out to be extraordinary in God's eyes. And then there's a story of the boy that was attending this outdoor event, uh, probably with his parents. Uh, it's a fairly remote place in northern Israel along the Sea of Galilee. They knew it was going to be a long day, so, you know, and there's no place to buy food up there, so uh, he brought a lunch, most likely packed by his mother. Five barley loaves and two small fish. I looked up this, uh, the barley loaf thing just because I'm curious sometimes. Barley was used by poor people because it was cheap. It was cheaper than, than wheat. And the barley loaves aren't like the loaves that, a loaf of bread that we see today. Simply not. So they were unleavened wafer shaped things that, uh, that resembled small flat pitas. They're about the, about the size of a regular slice of bread today, maybe an inch thick. Scored at the top so you could break them in two. And uh, they might be one or two servings. I just thought that was interesting. Well, suddenly one of the event staff, one of the followers of the day's main speakers, steps up to, the, to him and says, Hey, kid, we need your lunch. And he hands it over. And just a few minutes later, Jesus, the man they came to hear that day, multiplies those five barley loaves and two fish into enough food to feed 5,000 people. You can read about it in John chapter 6. <clears throat> There's this kid, at the, he's at an outdoor event. He's not expecting anything. He's doing whatever he's doing, hanging out. He gives up his lunch, and as a result, 5,000 people are blessed with food and countless millions are blessed with a story of God's compassion, His power, and His wisdom. Ordinary people doing ordinary things that turn out to be extraordinary in God's eyes. <clears throat> and then there's the woman from Sychar in Samaria. She came to draw water from the well. She came at midday instead of early in the morning to avoid the other women because she had a bad reputation in town. And she'd, uh, she'd had five husbands and she was currently living with her boyfriend that she was not married to. She comes to the well and who should she meet? But Jesus. And they have a conversation. He knows about her sinful life. And he reveals that 
He is the living water. He's our Savior and our King. He is the Messiah. Well, she's so impressed that she runs back into town and she tells the townspeople, hey, the Messiah is up at the well. And so they all go out to, to see him. And because of her testimony, people came out to see Jesus and many were saved. It was just another day for her, nothing special going on. But because of her testimony, others believed in Jesus and were saved. It's ordinary people doing ordinary things that turn out to be extraordinary in God's eyes. Well, I have one more story. But for this story, we have to fast forward several centuries until the late 1950s, well before most of you were born. For several years, school teacher Ronald Ford drove his Chevy. And yes, he got a lot of flack for that, Mr. Ford driving a Chevy. He drove his Chevy in Palace seven miles out of his way every Sunday morning to make sure that two little boys made it to Sunday school. He couldn't know the impact that his act of charity would have on those lives. He was merely doing what he thought that any follower of Christ should do. It was no big deal to him. He was faithful year after year, rain or shine, sun or snow. Doesn't sound like much of a story, does it? It sounds like something that you can just shrug off because it doesn't really impact you. But I can't shrug it off because I was one of those little boys. And there's more of the story. When I was 12 or 13, I told Mr. Ford I didn't want to go to church anymore. I thought he'd be okay with it. You know, he just went about his business. But boy, was I wrong. I was shocked, stunned when I saw the look of hurt on his face and the tears in his eyes. Why would my not going to church make a grown man cry? Especially this good and decent man. And it haunted me for years that I'd made him cry. All through high school and my time in the army, every now and then I'd, I would see that face and see those tears and I'd I'd get a knot in my stomach and I'd, I'd somehow I'd feel guilty or ashamed. I didn't quite understand it. Many years later, several years later, I did accept Christ as my Savior. And I saw Mr. Ford walking on the other side of the street and I thought, well, this is my chance. If I can just let him know that, I, that I'm saved now, it will atone for making him cry all those years ago. So I went across the street. I ran up to him. I was so excited. I said, Mr. Ford, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. He started crying again. But it was different this time. There were happy tears. And the twist in all this is that now, every, every time I think of Mr. Ford, I get tears in my eyes. Well, I've told you these stories about ordinary people because I believe that God expects you and I to live ordinary lives in an extraordinary way. In fact, I think he expects us to live extraordinary lives that impact the people around us. He expects us to live lives of excellence, godly lives. Christians are supposed to be the the light and the darkness. We're supposed to be the ambassadors of Jesus Christ so that we can impact people around us for the good and for God. Our church vision statement here at Calvary says, we desire to follow God so passionately and love people so actively that our community will encounter Christ through us before they ever set foot in the church. If you think about it, you have no idea how many people you may influence as you go about your daily living, for good or for bad. 
Colossians 1.10 tells us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You know, all of us want to make a difference in life. You know, life is short. We don't want to waste our lives on things that don't matter. The stories that I related to you today, uh, the, the people had no idea that their actions would ultimately impact thousands or even millions of people. Some of these folks were being used by God in spite of themselves. They had no idea that they were being used by God to accomplish His purposes. And whether we know it or not, or whether we like it or not, unbelievers watch us all the time, especially if they know that we're Christians. They study us from a distance. They pay attention to how we do things. You know, people who don't know Jesus are watching. You know, how do you handle problems at work? Uh, do you laugh at dirty jokes? They look at how you dress and what movies or TV shows you you watch, or how you spend your money, how you raise your kids, how do you respond when tragedy strikes? How do you deal with difficult people? They look at what are your priorities. Is is Christ and church a priority for you, or is it just one more thing that you do in your busy life? They watch what you do, and they hear what you say. And it's no secret that Christians are held to a higher standard than other people. Everybody sins, but when a Christian sins, it reflects on the entire body of Christ. Unbelievers see that, and they'll, they'll say that we're a bunch of hypocrites. They'll say we can't be trusted. We don't really believe what we preach, or we certainly don't practice what we preach. They'll say that God is distant and powerless, or that He doesn't exist at all. And that's why we have to be careful about how we live our lives. Sin is not a private matter. No matter how hidden or private you think it is, your sin impacts your relationship with Christ and your relationship with other people. As followers of Jesus, we must not lead others into sin. Paul, writing in, uh, to the Romans, he said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Any of you here familiar with the name Mordecai Ham? Mordecai Ham was an evangelist. He had a, a radio show. Uh, he, had, he did a lot of tent revival meetings uh, all over the South uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, he was in Charlotte, North Carolina one night in 1934, and he preached the gospel, and a young Billy Graham gave his life to Christ. And of course, we know Billy Graham. He preached the gospel to millions around the world. And I'm sure that over the years, other people, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of people, were saved because Mordecai Ham preached the gospel. But there's more to the story. Even though he preached the gospel, he wasn't necessarily a nice man. He was known for preaching the gospel, but he was also known for his terrible racism. So much so that other preachers called him out on it. They actually wrote books about Mordecai Ham and his racism. He passionately hated Jews and Catholics and uh, African Americans, and he often preached against them. He believed all kinds of conspiracy theories. Although hundreds of people may have been saved by his preaching, and it's, and it's sincere, they're sincere conversions. How many people were turned away from God because of his bigotry? How many today are turned off by TV preachers that are caught in sin or are obviously in it for the money? How many people are turned away from Christianity because of your behavior? Maybe you like to flirt with people you're not married to. Maybe you like to tell off-color jokes or 
Maybe you're a complainer or a gossip. Or maybe you use rough language. Sin is not a private matter. I believe God wants us to live excellent lives. And by excellent, I mean godly. We need to live our lives so that even unbelievers are impressed by our behavior. Proverbs 16, 7 says this, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Christians ought to be the most honest people in the world, the kindest, the most gracious. We should be the most forgiving. I try to think of that every time I get cut off on the freeway. We should be the most generous people and the most trustworthy. Philippians 2, Do all things without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Well, unfortunately, it's often the the opposite. Many people don't want to interact with Christians because of the way Christians act. I think of the uh, the what happened a, a few years ago with the Westboro Baptist Church and the and the hatred that they spewed. Well, as Americans, we're independent thinkers, so it's a hard pill to swallow to understand that your life is not your own. Your life is to be a blessing to other people. And Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. One of your main purposes in life is to point people to the Savior. We're to worship God, to fellowship with other believers, and to minister to others around the world. I'll say it again, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You need to be looking for ways to help people in need and to to motivate the people around you and become a person of influence. I saw examples of that yesterday. Helping. Mark 10 tells us, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for many. You need to live your life close to God. You need to be close enough to hear Him when He whispers. And that takes prayer. Only then will you be ready to act when He calls. Well, I don't have to tell you, Satan doesn't like any of this. He'll do everything he can to trip you up or to to trick you into refusing what God wants you to do. He'll make you fearful. He'll throw roadblocks in your way and he'll create havoc to make your life miserable. He'll bring up your past mistakes, your your sinful behavior. But you've got to remember, you're not your past and you're not your failures. God does not want you to be shackled to your past. He has amazing things for you right here in the present and in the future. You need to let the Holy Spirit guide you. and you know, We should be living godly lives. Well, let me see if I can tie all this stuff together. The prophet Elisha impacted a slave girl who in turn influenced her master for the glory of God. And we see the power of God awakened in a simple act of faith. A young boy gave up his lunch and blessed millions through the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And we see how God loves us, how He cares for us, and how He provides for us. And a moral woman told others about Jesus and many were saved. And we see how our sinful lives can be forgiven and we can be used by God no matter what our past life is like. And a school teacher 
drove a kid to Sunday school every week, and here we are. We need to be aware of how others see us. You don't know how you're going to impact the people around you. We need to live godly lives so that our influence will draw people to the Lord Jesus Christ. The slave girl didn't know that I was going to need a lesson on faith. The boy with the lunch didn't know that I was going to need a lesson on how God loves me and provides for me. The woman at the well didn't know that I would need a lesson on moving on from a sinful lifestyle and serving God. And Mr. Ford certainly didn't know that he would be held up as an example of godly living. And we don't know what impact we have on the people around us now and in the future. So praise team comes up. I want to say that the Holy Spirit of God lives within each and every believer. Let that be the spark that influences those around us. As we go about our ordinary lives, doing ordinary things, let's do our best to make sure that our influence on others is for the good and for God.